Thank you so much for coming. My name is Colleen Duke. I'm a public affairs officer with the Canadian Consulate General in Chicago. And uh, representing the Government of Canada, we really appreciate the opportunity to be at this conference and to share what is occurring in Canada to address climate change. Um, I have three great panelists, so I'm not going to speak very long. But from the federal perspective, uh, Canada's 2030 climate change targets have been set and we will commit to reach those. Um, we think the federal commitment to innovate a cleaner economy that reduces emissions and protects the environment is critical and of course acknowledge the existence of climate change because that keeps coming up again and again and again at these events. Um, some of the things in the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change which is actually available online on the Canadian Federal website is uh, to reduce gas emissions by 30% below 2005 levels, including establishing the Pan-Canadian Framework, which includes ma major investments in climate solutions. There is a Pan-Canadian approach to pricing carbon, uh, with all Canadian jurisdictions having pricing in place by this year, and I think you'll probably hear a bit about that from our panelists, as well as accelerating the phase-out of traditional coal-fired electricity. Government of Canada is continuing to work with all partners, including provinces, territories, indigenous people, and the business community to find opportunities for transitioning to a clean growth economy. We have three wonderful speakers uh, to share their research and what is going on in their provinces today. First up will be Dr. Ian Morrow, who is an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Winnipeg. He has degrees in environmental science and geography from Manitoba and did a postdoctoral fe uh, fellowship at the University of Victoria. He'll tell you more about his work. He's uh, launching a fantastic project on an interactive climate atlas of Canada that should be going live super soon. Um, like as we speak, it's, uh, it's coming down to the crunch. Uh, secondly, we have Jean-Francois Hould, who is the delegate at the, uh, the Quebec government office here in Chicago. Jean-Francois is fairly new to Chicago. We're very excited to have him here and have him partnering with the consulate on various events. Uh, he graduated from the University of Montreal and has a number, has had a number of positions in Quebec government, uh, including one in the States before in New York. Last but not least, the Ian Stone, uh, Liam Stone, sorry, I have Ian and Liam, and I've been screwing this up for the last two days. Uh, Liam is joining us from the uh, Alberta Government Office in Washington. Uh, over the years that he has worked um, with, uh, in Alberta government, he's focused on envir uh, excuse me, environment and energy issues that are critical to Alberta's trading relationship with the United States. Uh, he's worked with various ministries and has served as senior policy advisor to a federal minister at Environment Canada and Intergovernmental Affairs. So without taking any more time, I would like to uh, invite Ian Morrow up with his presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Again, my name is Ian Morrow. I'm with the University of Winnipeg. Planet Earth, it's our home. Indeed, it's our only home. The perfect combination of Atmosphere, soil, water, and all the necessary ingredients of life. And yet, we are seriously compromising not just the viability of life on this planet for ourselves, but for all of life itself. We are changing the chemistry of this atmosphere, and climate change is with us and that is perhaps most obvious in the Canadian Arctic. I've spent over a decade living in the Canadian Arctic, doing research, spending time with Inuit, the indigenous people of that area. And some would say the Arctic is at a tipping point, that as the ice melts and we lose that reflection of sunlight back into the atmosphere, the oceans increase in their warmth because they're dark. They absorb that heat, they absorb that energy. And the Arctic is known as, by some, the air conditioner of the planet. As the Arctic changes, everything changes. And for me, you often hear, and I've seen in presentations at this conference, what about the polar bears? 
the iconic image of climate change on the sea ice platform. But when I'm in the Arctic, I don't see polar bears as much as I see people on that sea ice platform. This is a picture of Luki Erut, a master hunter and master carver in the Iglulik area. Iglulik is a region in the Canadian Arctic that's over 5,000 years old. You think back in time, oh, 5,000 years old. Egyptians, Phoenicians, cultures of past time. The Inuit are still alive. The Inuit are still thriving. This photo was taken literally a couple years ago. Luki is hunting there in a way that people had been hunting for millennia. But that was literally, you know, the equivalent of yesterday. He's hunting walrus, which is an important species uh, for food in the region. And when I'm in the Arctic, it really makes me think about my kids and all kids. I was walking through a Glulik one day and this child was riding his tricycle like a skateboard. And bang! He slammed into that piece of the wood and he flew through the air like Superman. And it made me think, how do we land safely in this time of uncertainty? And I think this kid has a lot of the answers, actually. He's doing a lot with a little. He's being really resourceful. He's being creative. He's using his mind to solve problems. And he's having fun. And I think those are all lessons of our time. We have to figure out how to harness that creative intellect to solve a global challenge. So at the Prairie Climate Center, where I'm one of the co-directors at the University of Winnipeg, we're trying to put everything we have at solving this problem. This is a map that got published uh, by our team and got circulated in media across Canada. This is projected change mean temperature. This is January um, from baseline. So from the 1976 to 2005 period, this is the change in degrees Celsius for the month of January across Canada leading out to 2050 to 2080. So from basically our baseline of now into the future for January, if you look at the temperature change in the Arctic, you see the parts that are purple and really dark maroon. That's a 10 degree Celsius change from baseline. That's 50 degrees Fahrenheit change at the end of the century. That is the change that we're talking about in the Canadian Arctic. But if you take a look at the map, it's all over Canada. And if you think about your own country, it's all over your country as well. So what we're trying to do is bring the visual story of climate change to people. We think that communication is critical. We know most of the answers. We're actually talking about the answers in this conference. We know what they are. We have to bring it to people. And there's a lot of work on visualizing climate change, how you bring it to people in a way that's visual. And if the, you make it more local and you make it more relevant, the more likely people are to act. There's literature on this. I'm also interested in the spatial humanities and film. I'm actually a filmmaker. I'm a researcher and filmmaker. And there's a lot of research out there that's talking about the importance of film to establish sense of place. I'm a geographer. Place is really important. The more you talk about your own place, the more people are to act. So over the past decade, I've been making films. I started in the Arctic and made Inuit knowledge and climate change. I made this film with Zacharias Kunuk. And for those of you that don't know him, he's amongst the most famous indigenous filmmakers in the world. He made a film called Atanaju at the Fast Runner, which is considered the most, most famous Canadian film ever made. It won the camera door at, at Cannes Film Festival. Um, he literally kind of rewrote the map around uh, indigenous cinema, and I got the opportunity to work with Zach, and we made this film. You can look for it online, and you can watch it online. And I want to actually contend um, something Gina McCarthy said yesterday. She actually said that communities need to speak on behalf of indigenous people to raise their voice. And I actually totally disagree with that. I think that is the wrong message. I think that communities need to speak for themselves. And I think that indigenous communities have a different way of saying things. And their message counts and how they say it matters. And we need to listen to indigenous communities, not speak for them. And in our country, that's a big deal. You get caught speaking for indigenous communities, you better look out. And so when we do this work, we do it really carefully. We do it collaboratively. And that's an important message I wanted to leave here today. If you want to learn more about this film, 
They did a segment on This American Life about it just uh, in the fall. We went from there, we made climate change in Atlantic Canada, and we were documenting stories of sea change. Oceans are increasing in size and volume. The storms are increasing. Coastal communities, just like you know in your country, are under threat. We were looking at that in Atlantic Canada. In BC, we just finished a film that's about to come out called Beyond Climate. And in this one, we're looking at the pathway of awareness, despair, hope, and action. I actually mapped this one out. That's based on activist theory. How do you take people through the challenge of this issue? Well, you create awareness. And when you do that, you create despair. But you have to take people through hope, but you have to do more than that, you have to take them to action. And so we've got a film that's designed to do that. We've been working on the prairies. We've been working with indigenous communities, and I, I don't work just with indigenous communities, but this particular fellow is worth mentioning. Uh, Dave Kershane, leading Earth Man, he writ, lit the sacred fire at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. And uh, on the panel earlier, uh, there was a mention about the Pope and the importance of heart, starting with heart. That's actually a message that we hear from Dave Crushane all the time. It's a change of the human heart that's required first, and so there's some similarities uh, amongst all the messages that we're hearing. We've toured these films across Canada. We brought them back into communities. I've toured extensively with David Suzuki, who's a well-known Canadian broadcaster and environmentalist, taking these issues out into community, engaging community in conversation, because that's how I think we save um, the world. I think we do it through conversation. We don't talk at people, we have to talk with people. We've had these exhibits in Royal Ontario Museum and other museums where we're creating installations where we're communicating these issues to the public because the public matters. It can't just be insular conversations at universities. And we've started to think about how do we bring this all together now? And this idea of the Climate Atlas was born. These are some skin kind of frame, frameworks for the, the new website that's coming out different topics that we can explore, all the videos. We're interested in virtual reality and animation. We've got it mobile. We're talking about monitoring so that you could actually use your phone to monitor climate change. And we've got city reports coming out very soon about all of Canada's cities because that's where people are and we want to engage people. So we're talking about cities. I just came back from the IPCC meetings in Edmonton where the United Nations was meeting about cities. I can tell you there's a very exciting conversation going on about subnational governments. And in your country, subnational governments are where the action is. Obviously, the federal uh, government in this country is lacking in all kinds of ways, but the cities are where the action is because the cities are seeing where the impacts are and they're also seeing where the opportunities for change can be. And so we've been making videos about cities, we've been releasing these reports, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity to work in cities like Chicago and other major cities across the U.S. And this is a video that we made with uh, Toronto, and they are seeing huge impacts, like huge impacts in Toronto with uh, the Great Lake, you know, flooding, and that's been, uh, Toronto Island on the bottom right there. Uh, there are go trains underwater, all kinds of things, and they know that the costs of doing nothing are actually more costly than taking action. So the Climate Atlas is soon to come out. Uh, that's a, a picture of it. I'm going to get off the stage right away, but I want to show you this thing is actually live. Um, it's a real thing. And so you can click anywhere in our country in this map and you can learn about climate futures. And so I showed you that initial map at the beginning. Uh, these are plus 30 days. I'm from Winnipeg. And if you go into Winnipeg, just as an example, and you click on Winnipeg, this is our baseline. We get about 11 plus 30 days on average in Winnipeg, which is about you know, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you look into that far future, high carbon far future, it's gonna jump by about 40 plus 30 days or 100 degree Fahrenheit days. And we're gonna get upwards of 50, 100 degree Fahrenheit days now in Winnipeg. If you look at your country and the conversation about heat waves, this is coming here. This is not just the Arctic, this is everywhere. When we talk about health and we talk about all these things, take a look at that. End of the century in Winnipeg, where I'm from, upwards of 73, 74, 100 degree Fahrenheit days. We're not ready for that, but we can be. We absolutely can be. And I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that we can totally do something about this. And again, for me, I think it starts with communication and talking uh, in a good way to each other about our own places and how they're affected. Thanks. That was fast. You want to <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Ramblers fan, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to present Quebec's approach addressing climate change. I think my, I have to start this for you, Martin. <laughs> 
Here we are. And there you go. Mm -hmm. And to start it. Here. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you today to present Quebec's approach to addressing climate change and what can be done on the subnational level to fight climate change. The effect of climate change are already being felt around the world. The problem knows no borders, and like me, you acknowledge that cooperation is essential in the face of the global challenge. We must, we must meet major environment challenges, and now, more than ever, it's time to work together. All the problems that we are experiencing with respect to water management, protecting air quality and biodiversity, and managing residual materials and contaminated soils exacerbated by climate change. And the consequences this is having on our health, the environment, on infrastructure, and our economy are very real. Quebec is, all, is aware of that fact. It has been making climate change a priority for nearly 20 years now. It's at the core of Quebec's new international policy, which has been launched in April of last year for the 15th anniversary of the Ministry of International Relations. Over the years, we have implemented several climate change response measures and actions. This includes highlighting the promoting the recognition of the important role played by, by, uh, play in this fight by some national entities, including federated states, during the negotiations of the conferences of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement gave concrete expression to that negotiation. It was made possible through the mobilization of new state actors and actions of international groups consisting of federal states, such as the Climate Group and the Network of Regional Governments for Sustainable Development. Quebec is a member of these groups and plays a leadership role in them. Last fall, Quebec government also began appointing envoys and giving them mandates focusing on government priorities and the main trust of Quebec's international policy. The envoy for climate change to Northern and Arctic Affairs is Jean Lemire, a biologist and science communicator who is recognized worldwide for his travels across the planet's oceans in conjunction with his work on climate change and biodiversity. Mr. Lemire has been tasked with developing new international partnerships um, aimed to reducing greenhouse gases, adapting carbon pricing mechanisms. Quebec's approach to address climate change is built on two fundamental pillars. One is reducing greenhouse gases, and the other one is adapting to the impacts of the climate change. Quebec has set ambition short, medium, and long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. A 20% reduction below 1990 levels by 2020, and a 37.5% reduction by 2030. We believe that putting a price on carbon in the economy is the most effective way to combine economic development and greenhouse gas reduction, which are two complementary and non-conflictive objectives in the mind. With that in mind, we undertook the implementation of a cap and trade system for greenhouse gas emission allowances in January 2013. It's commonly referred as the carbon market. Our carbon market covers 85% of Quebec's greenhouse gas and is now the spearhead of the government's strategy to fight climate change. The 2014 Quebec, in 2014, sorry, Quebec linked its carbon market to California, thereby creating the largest carbon market in North America and the first to be designed and operated by subnational governments in different countries. The Canadian province of Ontario also joined our carbon market this year. Further reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help Quebec society adapt to the effects of climate change, the Quebec government committed to reinvesting all revenues generated by the carbon market into a green fund that is used finance measure for 2013-2020 climate change action plan. Most specifically, these measures are introduced uh, are intended to stimulate research and innovation to develop green greenhouse gas reduction technology in several sectors, including sustainable mobility, energy efficiency, conventing to renewable energy, transportation, green, green buildings, and adapting to impact of climate change. Over the two-thirds of the market's revenue has been allocated to reducing the, tran uh, the transportation sector's carbon footprint. This sector accounts for 41% of Quebec greenhouse emissions. One of the major challenges in the fight against climate change is funding, and Quebec wishes to contribute to that endeavor in the inter at the international level. That's why in 2015, utilizing the revenue generated by the carbon market, Quebec announced financial support totaling $25.5 million over five years to help the most vulnerable francophone countries fight climate change more efficiently. 
I talk about <coughs> the Quebec approach of reducing the greenhouse gases. I'll mean now to present Quebec's action on climate change adaptation. That's the other side of our strategy, especially with respect to uh, public health. The repercussions of climate change are already being uh, felt in Quebec and will translate into heat waves and more frequent extreme pre pre precipitation, as well as more intense storms, <coughs> coastal erosion and permafrost thawing uh, have become more pronounced in the past few years and will continue to worsen. Uh, Jan and I had an interesting conversation of that uh, a few days ago. Uh, it's very easy to, to see it right now in Quebec. Also, several regions of Quebec more recently affected by major floods. Whether it's due to such factors as, uh, as heat, the increased presence of pollen allergens, or poor air quality, the physical and psychological health of individuals and communities is at risk under this, these circumstances. In addition, the economic, social, and environmental costs, the current and future impacts of climate change are enormous. Several studies show that the cost of inaction is greater than the investment needed for the uh, adapting to the impacts of the climate change. To be in the better position to prevent these situations, the Quebec government launched in 2013 into 2020, as I was saying, the government strategy for climate change adaptation in June 2012. This strategy aims to put forward the commitments and actions needed to strengthen Quebec society's resilience to climate change in order to reduce negative impacts and capitalize on the opportunities associated with it. The strategy is based uh, on four issues affecting the sectors that are most vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. The first one is the well-being of the population and the communities. The second is the continuation of the economic activities. The third one, the permanence and safety of buildings and infrastructure. And the fourth one is the maintenance of essential ecological services. One of the concrete measures implemented was the creation of a system of monitoring and preventing the impacts of extreme weather uh, events on health. Uh, the system is developed by the National Public Health Institute Quebec, of Quebec and provides available information for taking preventive action during heat waves. It also issues health alerts coupled with response actions by health network. The system scope was recently expanded to include all the other extreme weather events like floods, and also forest fires. Another example, and I want to say, is the creation of, an action, uh, of concrete action, is the implementation of projects to combat the heat islands effect in urban areas, such as greening pedestrian streets, public parking lots, public squares, school yards, and playgrounds. Two public observatories also have been created, the Quebec Multiparty Observatory of Zoonosis and Climate Change Adaptation, which focus on diseases linked to climate change, such as Lyme disease and West Nile virus, and Quebec Observatory on Climate Change Adaptation, which monitors the evolution of adaptation in government and municipal organization and the population, mostly in relation with heat, floods, pollen allergen, and infectious disease. Several projects are underway, uh, including a research project uh, improving the responses to the psychological needs and individual communities affected by climate variation. Another project involves also the creation of a toolbox for tracking the long-term effects of major disaster on mental health. The action plan is a rolling plan to, that takes that in account the advancement of scientific knowledge, the level of progress made in achieving the, uh, the objectives that have been set, the government policies direction, and available revenue. A midterm review of the action plan is about to be released and will be able to serve as the basis of strengthening the active effectiveness of response measures in Quebec over the coming years. In 2001, the, uh, the Quebec government invested in the creation also of URANAS and has supported the development even since. This uh, non-profit organization is a consortium of regional climatology and adaptation of climate change which brings together over 450 researchers and more than 100 organizations. RENES has the expertise to assess the social, economical, and environmental impacts of climate change, as well as the, uh, to identify, evaluate, and implement adaptation strategies. The work that RENES carries and out meets uh, the concrete needs uh, of the government's various departments and their partners, so they are able to take climate change into account and make us able to make decisions. The organization that produced the study aimed to estimate uh, certain costs uh, associated with the impact of climate change. According to the estimate in that study, climate change in Quebec will lead significant government expenditures on public health on the range of several hundreds of millions of dollars by 2064. Added to this are all the social and economic consequences over the next 50 years. 
Lastly, the entire world is mobilizing to address the pressing and complex issue, and we should be glad about that. Uh, we should be glad also about the leadership that has been taken by cities and by some national government, I think. As a federal state, Quebec intends to assume its full role in the spirit of international cooperation, an urgency that currently is spearheading a climate action. Synergy with research communities and local partners, including municipalities and companies, have made it possible over the past few years to move adaptation forward in Quebec, especially with regards to public health, coastal erosion, and permafrost melting. The sooner federated states and regions invest in adapting measures that are appropriate to their situation, the better able they will be to limit the costs resulting from climate change. In conclusion, it goes without saying that greater collaboration, both at the Canadian level and internationally, will eventually broaden the scope of our action and benefit resulting from them. If the Ramblers can beat Miami hurricanes, like they did last year, so we can do and by climate change, but the game is not over. Anybody in the room know where they hid the Alberta climate presentation? <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to tap dance. Thank you, everyone, for coming out uh, to listen uh, to presentations about Canadian climate policy. It, um, as, as was mentioned, I work in Washington, and I can tell you that I have a very good sense that Canada is a small fish in a, in a big pond, so we appreciate your attention. Um, and coming out today to to listen to you know some of the policies that are that are that are coming to the fore uh, in Canada. I represent the province of Alberta in Washington. Um, as a province, uh, we we supply the United States with about thirty percent of your oil imports, just slightly more than that, and something north of ninety percent of your natural gas imports. Um, we have the third largest oil reserves in the world. We have about a 300 year supply of natural gas and it's said that uh, anywhere you stick a shovel in Alberta, you're going to hit coal. So, you know, our friends in Quebec have made the investments in, in hydropower. I would say that when they are, um, uh, you know, when we look at the differences in our economies, they're essentially starting from a position where much of their energy is coming from non-emitting sources. And so if you think about uh, maybe the New England states with nuclear, you know, some, some other states, when you think about Alberta, you're thinking about Texas, you're thinking about Wyoming, you're thinking about uh, uh, Colorado um, in terms of energy resources. So really what you're seeing is bookends um, in the energy endowment spectrum and for that reason, you see different climate policies emerging. Um, so I'll keep talking. Um, I, politically in Alberta, we, uh, up until 2015, we'd had 40 years of uh, a conservative government in power. And in the spring of 2015, uh, I'm up. In the spring of 2015, uh, the people of Alberta elected a left of center government um, after after 40 years of right of center government. I like to try to sort of set the benchmarks for our American friends. We had a right of center government that supported single payer health care and gun control, um, and we went to a left of center government that supports oil sands development and uh, international trade. So. This ideological spectrum may be a little narrower than what you, you might be used to. Um, but that being said, uh, our new government got elected in the spring of 2015, and one of the things uh, that it ran on was that Alberta's climate policies to that point had been insufficiently ambitious. We had a price on carbon um, before that for our large industrial emitters, but the government brought in, uh, asked an advisory panel uh, led by an academic from the University of Alberta, 
to take a look at the, the province's situation and develop some recommendations uh, that work for our province. And as I said, I mean, a province that has a very different energy endowment and economy um, than some of our friends in other, uh, in other provinces. And I think this graph really uh, lays out the challenge for Alberta. So in a lot of jurisdictions that aren't energy producers, you're looking at your transportation, you're looking at energy efficiency as sort of the big parts of this pie. Uh, in Alberta, you're looking at oil and gas and mining, you're looking at oil sands um, as big uh, contributors to our emissions profile. And so any policy uh, needs to take a close look at how we're reducing those large uh, industrial emissions. So what did they come up with? Uh, there's sort of four pillars, not sort of, there are four pillars uh, to our climate strategy. Uh, the first is that we're, um, right now we're around 50% uh, coal fire electricity generation in our province. As I said, anywhere you stick a shovel you're finding coal. Um, as with any jurisdiction with that endowment, we, we you know, relied heavily on that energy source. The government's committed to phasing out coal emissions by 2030. That means if CCS becomes economically viable, uh, we'll take a look at it. But right now, the government has struck agreements with our coal-fired generators, and they've all agreed to shutter their plants uh, by this 2030 date. At the same time, the government committed to 30% renewables in our uh, electri gen electri electricity generation mix. Uh, we did not have a program to incent renewables before this strategy. And I'll get into sort of how we've done that uh, using revenue from our, our price on carbon. Uh, but that's, that's the government's uh, ambition for 2030 in terms of renewables. We've implemented an economy-wide price on carbon. So as a consumer, if you lived in Alberta, you would be paying $30 a ton uh, when you went to fill up at the pump. You'd be paying $30 a ton when you're heating your home with natural gas. Depends on exchange rate, but just uh, to give you a sense, $30, $30 Canadian a ton is equivalent to about a 25 cent uh, gas tax here uh, in the United States. So we thought uh, as a government that we would, um, we wanted to create incentives across the economy for people to look at efficiency, for people to look uh, not only to an industry but also themselves in terms of how they can reduce emissions and putting a price on carbon does that. Um, Quebec talked about their coverage. Uh, we're between 78 and 90 percent uh, of our emissions are covered by that price. There's been some disputes about pipelines. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that environmental activists have talked about is that if we approve pipelines, it's going to create un unhindered growth in upstream oil and gas emissions. And so the government heard that. And the government brought in a cap, a hard cap, on our oil sand sector that said you cannot increase your emissions beyond 100 megatons a year uh, going forward. Right now, for, uh, for context, we're about 70 megatons a year. That gives headspace for projects that were already, um, uh, where investment had already taken place. But going forward, if you're an oil sands developer, you essentially have to bring technology to bear that gives you headspace under that cap. So you've got an incentive from a carbon pricing perspective, you've also got an incentive from a cap on emissions perspective. Mm -hmm. And as an industry, they have to work together in order to um, comply with this, uh, with this cap. We think if you're, an, you know, I'll give you an example. If you're a regulator in Minnesota who's looking at a pipeline, and is concerned about the long-term greenhouse gas, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions associated with that pipeline, this is the policy that gives you the certainty that you can go ahead with energy infrastructure without just creating un, uh, unhindered growth. Uh, we heard from the administrator last night, Alberta essentially adopted um, an equivalent methane target from oil and gas sector to what the Obama climate plan uh, uh, included, which is 45% by 2025. Uh, your current administration has said that they're not going to continue uh, with that goal. Alberta's continuing with that goal. We're working with the federal government right now to finalize our regulations for uh, our oil and gas sector. And uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, 
great opportunities in terms of uh, better efficiency and more competitiveness coming out of that uh, coming out of that goal. I found when I talk to people in Washington uh, and, and, and in states that are looking at carbon pricing that uh, a lot of the discussion is not around should we levy a carbon price. The debate actually comes in how are we going to spend it? And that's when, when legislators are getting together trying to decide how to spend money, uh, it gets pretty contentious. So I'll just sort of, we've got a lot of numbers here. I'll go through a few highlights uh, for you. One of the big um, criticisms, I would say, of carbon prices is that low-income consumers spend more of their income on energy than high-income consumers. And so uh, when you put a price on carbon, it hurts low-income families and individuals more than it hurts uh, high-income. In Alberta, we've managed that by uh, allocating 2.3 billion of the approximately 10 billion that we're going to raise over the next five years uh, to low and middle income families and individuals. That means if you're a, mid a low income individual in Alberta, on average, you're better off. So you're getting a check from the government that rebates you the cost of the carbon price, and that check is actually going to be more than what you're paying um, at the pump and to heat your home. So we've essentially made a carbon price a more progressive um, taxation tool that helps to mitigate the concerns about uh, impact on low income, uh, low income people. Cut, cut small business taxes from three to 2%. As I said, we're getting out of the business of traditional coal fired generation. Those communities, again, as the administrator talked about last night, they need to be supported as they make that transition out of that, uh, out of the, uh, coal sector, and so we've allocated nearly $200 million to help with that transition uh, to work with those communities <coughs> as they make those adjustments. Uh, $3.4 billion, um, I'll talk about how we're using it for um, renewable energy. A lot of that is also getting recycled back to support technologies uh, in our oil and gas sector um, to help those uh, companies um, with opportunities to really take step change reductions in their emissions and commercialize those technologies so that we can see drastically better performance out of, out of the oil sands going forward. And there's some great, um, uh, great projects right now that are at the commercial test stage. That means that companies are spending hundreds of billions of dollars on test facilities in order to commercialize them and they're going to make significant um, uh, emissions reductions. Um, going forward. I talked about electricity. So 30% by 2030. Alberta has a competitive electricity market. That means our friends in Quebec have a, a single company uh, that uh, produces electricity and sells it to consumers. We have a competitive market. That means there's multiple uh, generators in our, in our market. And the way to get to a 2030, um, we can't, we decided not to go with a a renewable portfolio standard, what we did was a reverse auction. That means in 600 uh, megawatt chunks, we're going to go to the market and say, bring us your best price for renewables, and we will, um, we will give you the increment between your best price and the market price. <coughs> the government set aside uh, a couple of billion dollars to make up that increment. We ran our first auction in the, we completed our first auction in the fall. And the prices we got were 3.7 cents Canadian a kilowatt hour, which I'm not sure if there's electricity nerds in the room. But for context, that in North America, those were the lowest prices we've seen outside of Mexican solar projects. So the, this transition is going to be a lot cheaper than the government envisioned in terms of having to make up that difference. Um, we're very excited about that. The next round, um, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about indigenous uh, participation in the economy. The next round, the government is requiring project proponents to bring an indigenous partner um, as they make their bid. So that's an equity partner that's doing projects on indigenous lands so that they are getting a revenue stream out of the uh, renewal project. And we think this is a way, and I think indigenous communities feel this is a way for them to participate in the energy transition in a way that's respectful of their... Um, uh, of their uh, traditional use of the land, but also gives them access into the economic growth that's coming um, as a result of this energy transition in Alberta. Uh, 
we hired a ambitious fifth grader to do this. Uh, um, I'm kidding. There's, there's some colleague in Edmonton that did this and they really worked hard. I'm, I shouldn't make fun of it. Uh, <coughs> so I don't know. Uh, as I said, we had a price on carbon uh, prior to 2015. And, and the way that we levied that price was that it was based on, um, let's say Ian had an oil sands facility. It, it uh, <coughs> let's make up a number. Uh, it, it emitted 10 megatons a year. And I had one in the same sector and I emitted five megatons a year. Under a past system, we benchmarked against your, your facility's past performance. So we asked for a 15% emissions intensity reduction so Ian would have to go to 8.5 megatons a year. I would have to go to 4 megatons a year. The downside to that policy is that you don't get a race to the top. Um, you don't get competitors trying to one-up each other and getting the benefit um, from the policy. So we've gone to, uh, we've gone to a policy that says, let's look at the average emissions across your sector. We're going to go to the 75th percentile in terms of best performers, and we're going to set the benchmark there. So let's say the 75th percentile is uh, 5 megatons a year. Ian all of a sudden has a much bigger bill to pay when he comes to paying for his carbon uh, in Alberta. That gives him an incentive um, to improve his technology as a laggard and bring himself down uh, and be competitive. I, if I'm a better performer, can move the benchmark on Ian by improving my performance. And that creates an incentive, a competitive incentive, where, you know, I have a lot of friends in the oil and gas sector. They really like to screw each other. Um, <laughs> it's part of the market economy. And we're harnessing that competitive um, uh, instinct in the market economy to try and create a race to the top and try and move the, move the um, emissions goalposts going forward. We think it's a really innovative policy, uh, um, uh, and it's going to create a lot, of, a lot more incentive uh, to, to drive down emissions. They also have some other options. They've, we've got some offset uh, options um, uh, that allow them to pay uh, non-regulated sectors like agriculture to do different uh, types of uh, and forestry to do different, you know, adopt different technologies or do different practices and monetize that um, in non-regulated sectors. So that's part of our, uh, a long starting standing part of our plan as well. So that, that's sort of the carbon market uh, in Alberta. And I think I'll close, uh, I was really taken with what the administrator said last night about is it the right thing to do and who's going to stand with you? And when our Premier announced this plan in the fall of, uh, of, of 2015, she had standing behind her Indigenous leaders, environmental group leaders, and oil sand CEOs on the same stage, ready, all ready to endorse this framework as what's right for Alberta. And I think that speaks to uh, what the administrator was talking about last night. You need to have a path forward in the economy. You need to have a path forward for the environment. And from our perspective, this is the right path forward for Alberta. So appreciate you taking the time and happy to answer questions. Thank you. And thank you all three for staying exactly on schedule, making my life easy. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. Let me off. Tell me what I'm doing. Uh, we'll Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, great. We have a question in the back. We'll just start right in. Go ahead. Yeah, so I have a microphone here oh, so that excellent. you can speak clearly into the mic and I stop you now. Thank you. Hello, Paul Campion, student here. Um, six days ago, I believe over 10,000 Canadians, Indigenous community members, marched in British Columbia in opposition to the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And I know you spoke a little bit to the pipeline question, but if Trudeau is going to put himself up 
And if the candidate is going to put themselves up as a climate leader, um, doesn't there have to be more than just a cap that allows for incredible 30 megatons of expansion and uh, 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 aggressively moving towards not allowing new fossil fuel projects? Um, and I know we're working hard in the US, and it's a long uphill battle in both places, but that's the question. Uh, sure. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, so I think we have, I mean, we've had very similar debates on both sides of the border around pipelines. I would, I would go back to what the administrator said last night. Um, I think that the prime minister has set out essentially an agreement in Canada that says we are going to do ambitious climate policy, but we're also going to build pipelines that allow us to get our exports to market. I think that what you've seen, um, you know, I think the Keystone example is an interesting one. Uh, you know, the project proponent wanted to get that built and in the ground a number of years ago. And so the question is, what have been the impacts of it not being built? And I think if you look globally, uh, the impacts have been significant new uh, oil production in Texas, where they can build pipelines to the Gulf Coast um, relatively easily. Uh, you've seen growing production from other parts of the world. And so from a climate perspective, um, while you continue to see demand uh, growing for oil, the question becomes, where do you want to get that oil from? And I think we have no objection to policies that incent electric vehicles. We have no objective to the low carbon fuel standard in California. In terms of managing demand, we, we, we believe that jurisdictions need to take the steps that they want to take. But as long as that demand exists, essentially your choice is, do you want to get your oil from a well-regulated jurisdiction, from a jurisdiction with a price on carbon? Or do you want to get your oil from the cheapest producer? And I think the first path means you're getting your oil, as we stand today, from Alberta and Norway. The second path is you're getting your oil from Saudi Arabia. And I think we can't live, we can't allow ourselves to get into a mindset where it's oil or renewables. There's going to be a transition period, and in that transition, we have to make the decision about where our oil comes from. So I would say the Prime Minister's approach on Kinder Morgan is to say, we want to be ambitious from a climate perspective in Canada, and that means the world should want the oil that we're selling. We are taking steps to reduce our demand for oil, we are taking steps to support other countries to reduce their demand for oil. But while there is demand for oil, we want it to be satisfied by a well-regulated supplier. So um, obviously your question strikes to the heart of what is an incredibly controversial issue in Canada right now, whether or not to expand pipelines or kind of launch into some kind of full uh, on you know renewable strategy is is hotly contested and Kinder Morgan's the flashpoint for it. I've been making a film about B climate change in BC, so I've literally been you know all through British Columbia talking to people about this, and you know people are concerned about oil on that coast. They're very concerned about the pipeline going through Burnaby through Vancouver. There's already been small oil spill uh, spills up in the northern part of of um, the the central coast. And so people on that coastline, their place, you know, and their, their, their environment is, is very important to them. And they are standing up and saying, we don't want this. There's actually municipal resolutions at the city of Vancouver and the city of Burnaby. The mayor and council of both of those cities have said they do not want this pipeline. 
And so you've got like subnational governments like Vancouver and Burnaby saying they don't want it. You've got the province of, of British Columbia saying they don't want it and now there's you know a serious conflict between Alberta and, and British Columbia right now it's a, it's a major thing in the news and the federal government is saying we want both we want to be able to be a climate leader and be uh, you know um, building pipelines and so people are calling out the Prime Minister right now they're saying you can't say that that doesn't make any sense but one of the interesting things is you know I think it depends where you are and who you are what what side of that kind of fault line you, you sit on uh, right now though um, one of the kind of ways of thinking about this is that a carbon tax that is now starting to roll will not survive unless it gets through the next federal election. And so we have an election coming up in about two years and there are anti-carbon taxation elements growing massively in Canada right now. And it is quite amazing. Like we, we stand here and we can say, we're climate leaders, we've got a carbon tax. And in two years, it might be a completely different conversation. Canada might look very differently. And so, you know, on the one hand, I, I kind of agree with you. And I say, how can we talk out both sides of our mouth like that? That makes no sense. But in a very complex terrain like Canada, what I, I believe the prime minister is trying to do is trying to appease these forces to get the carbon tax through an election. Um, so that it can be more fully entrenched inside policy and governments. And, and I think if, if we can do that, that's not an excuse. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think that's the, the prevailing thinking. Um, if that were to happen, that is going to create uh, the carbon taxation scheme for all of these provinces and territories. And once that happens, they're not going to want to go back because it's big money. In Manitoba, where I'm from, it's $260 million annually that's going to go into a fund and they have just set up the legislation and the first thing that they've done is put a hundred million dollars into a trust fund. This literally happened on Monday. A hundred million dollars into a trust fund that is overseen by a, a Nature Conservancy Crown Corporation that will have five million dollars forever to invest in uh, environmental initiatives that protect wetlands and natural systems to sequester carbon emissions. And so there, there's just an interesting thing here where I think they're trying to get it through the kind of psyche of the country, all these complexities, so that once it's entrenched, we can move on with the resources of a carbon tax, and I don't think anybody's going to push back. So I think it's a calculated move um, around trying to say these two things. And, you know, maybe there's logic in it, you know, in terms of a cap on emissions, obviously, no, we need to stop. The science says we need to stop now and, and yesterday. And so the trick is, the science tells us one thing, how do we get it through policy and politics and social structures? And that's the continuum we're on in Canada right now. I may have missed your point, but uh, is the carbon tax uh, continue to increase year by year, or is it a flat tax that is set now and not intended to increase? And then the question was, uh, the rebates that go back to lower income families, how do they design that? Can you specify a little more specifics on that, please? Uh, so under the Pan-Canadian framework, uh, the carbon price goes to $50 a ton uh, by 2022. So it is increasing and it'll be assessed at that time in terms of uh, future growth. Uh, you've exceeded my limits in terms of how they designed the uh, uh, rebate program. I know that it's a direct sort of cash rebate uh, to consumers and it was designed essentially to you know, put a progressive approach on to, uh, to make sure that low-income families weren't were, worse off. Uh, and it phases out as income levels grow. Um, and so it's essentially, if you're a, you know, a high-income individual, you're not getting the rebate, and that, that money you're paying is going back to the low-income individual. So I don't know if that's answered your question, but that's sort of the parameters. It starts at 10 bucks a ton, goes to 50. Um, in Manitoba, they, interestingly, I didn't talk about it in my presentation, but Manitoba has a conservative government right now. It's the first conservative government in North America to adopt carbon pricing, which is actually really interesting. So we're living in interesting times in Manitoba, and I'm hanging out with lots of conservatives more than I would have ever thought and having seriously productive conversations about how we move the needle on this stuff. Their scheme is slightly different. They have taken a $25 a ton flat rate over all the five years of the pan-Canadian framework kind of window that they've created. 
and they say that by having a higher initial price, they can actually drive the equivalent amount of emissions, even though they don't go to 50 at the end of the five-year term. And so they've got a different thing. And, and we're, right now, the federal government has a federal backstop paper. So the, the January 1st of 2019, if every province and every territory doesn't have carbon pricing or the equivalent of carbon pricing, it, it can be cap and trade or carbon pricing or carbon tax. If they don't have it in place by January 1st, the federal uh, government will impose their federal backstop on the provinces and territories. So it's, it's a fairly serious thing that's going on where they're pushing every province and territory to be in the game by January. And so our provincial budget dropped on Monday and they had to get the legislation and framework in place in this fiscal year to be able to be in place for that. So we've, we've moved very quickly um, to get in place for that and so this is this is moving quickly and and again it's all happening before our federal election so it's things are moving in, in Canada for sure and if I can say it's not every province has decided to go with a tax also there's a cap and trade market uh, the, the market uh, the carbon market system also it goes by auction in fact that's the the system that Quebec and Ontario has taken so far so there's different approach, as I will say. The thing important, I think, is also that people see the results of those uh, taxes or the, the, the fund that we put together in the green fund that we put. We are reaching one million billion dollars, in fact, in revenue since the creation of the fund. And we have to reinvest that money in pro programs that we'll see, that we'll see results. We launched a strategy on electric vehicles uh, to help the transition. Uh, right now, there's more than 108, uh, eight, uh, one, 1,800 uh, charging stations now in Quebec. Uh, we want to create more than 2,000 uh, jobs in, in that file. And so make people see that there's a real transition happening with the money that we are raising. It's another important thing, not just raising money and taxing for taxing, but we also link that, the, those profits to actual actions. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, you know, we we are in a situation where you know there might be there's going to be a provincial election in Alberta, and they could very easily go conservative. Um, there's uh, Saskatchewan, which is the province beside us, which is actually a holdout on the carbon tax. So not all provinces and territories have said yes. The Saskatchewan government is saying they've they've checked to see federally if whether or not it's legal um, to impose a federal carbon tax, and they're ready to fight and let the provinces impose uh, let the the federal government impose the carbon tax on them. Um, Ontario right now is liberal, uh, and they're likely to get toppled by a conservative government the way the polls are turning right now. And so Manitoba is this weird conservative holdout with a carbon tax. And, um, you know, we're trying to kind of pump up the volume around that and say, hey, this can be done. And there is a way to think about this as, you know, a fiscally prudent thing to do. And that if you're serious about being a conservative, well, you know, conservation is actually, you know, a really important kind of part of the word conservative. And if you want to get serious about being conservative, you have to think about that in an ecological sense, not just a fiscal sense. And these things can go hand in hand. And I'm not here to, you know, talk out both sides of my mouth. I'm not. But if you look at, I'm trained as an environmental scientist. If you look at, like, the root word of oikos and ecology and home and the way these things, economy and ecology, they all come from the same place. And again, working with the Inuit, if you, if you look at the way, you know, people who are close to the land work, their economies and their ecologies are always connected. And, you know, I don't, whether or not capitalism can be ecologically sensitive, you know, a lot of people would say that's not possible. But in the transition that we're in right now, is it possible to try and tune some of these instruments so that we can get freaking close, so that we can have a hope of, of, of turning some sort of corner in the immediate moment? And, and again, I'm not some sort of booster for government, but it's been really interesting in Manitoba to talk with these folks and, and, and get into this stuff with them because they see a value in it. And, and the value is the payout. The money that they're raising in Manitoba to be able to disperse into all of these activities is a huge, it's a huge opportunity, right? It's like a new tax stream that people might buy into. And the trick is, is if we can get climate change to cut across 
not just the economy, but all sectors of social justice, equity, all of these things, then all of a sudden you have people starting to support these things in different kinds of ways, and we're starting to see it. We actually have the farm community in Manitoba really on board with this stuff. They have an exemption right now, so they are not, they're exempt from the carbon tax, but they know that their industry has to change and they're given the opportunity for the transition. And I actually think that's a good idea because I work really closely with farmers and if you put another kind of, you know, you know, piece of hay on the camel's back, it is going to crack in agriculture in all kinds of places. And so it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to signal to industries and sectors of the economy, but people and livelihoods and everybody in society that things are changing. And you have to get on board with change. We're going to cut you some slack now, but you better get going with us. And we're starting to see that conversation happen in all kinds of ways. And, 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 and so I think there is a message of hope there. And, and I think that, you know, again, the conservative movement should be on board with climate change because it's actually good fiscal policy. It's going to save more money in the long run. And again, I'm not here to booster the economy and be some sort of hyper capitalist, but they do fit together. And if we can rig it so that people understand that and communicate that, then broad swaths of society are going to come with us because it's just going to make our lives better. So, uh, Zacharias Kunok and I made Kepehrengayuk Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. If you look it up, it's online. Um, uh, so, the Atlas Project, so the, the website that I showed you, climateatlas.ca, um, is actually going to host all of the videos inside it. And so, I didn't really talk about that because I was trying to get off the stage, but we're planning on taking all of that climate data and information. There you go, Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so if you dig, we're gonna take all that climate data inside this interactive cartography and have these stories come out of it. So you can look at your climate future, but also hear about stories on the landscape. And I showed a lot of indigenous case studies, but we've got you know solar panel stories, we've got all kinds of mitigation stories, city stories. There's so many different narratives of hope on the landscape, and we're out there documenting it and showing it to people. Because if you can see it, then you can believe it. And if you believe it, then you can start doing it in your own backyard. And that's the message for, from us, is that it, it's happening already. We're already in the transition. If you're not with us, you know, get on the bus. It's fun. <laughs> it's a transit plug. <laughs> An electric bus. Hi, my name is Maris. Um, I'm a student here. Uh, my question is, could you guys speak to the fundamental and kind of ideological differences that you see between American environmentalists and if there's been an aspect of your um, like childhoods or growing up that's been socialized in a way that you think is fundamental to those differences. I'm the American. I'm the American. <laughs> You're the American. You're the American. Yeah. I feel like we need couches full, up here now. No. Full disclosure, I am an American working for Canada, so luckily I have three excellent panelists. Actual Canadian. Well, there's all, there's all kinds of stuff. That's, Greenpeace started in Vancouver, right? Greenpeace is, you know, globally one of the most kind of famous environmental groups in the world, but they haven't always got it right either. Just because they're born in Canada, they disrupted the Inuit economy by saying that seals shouldn't be caught and all kinds of things. And so the environmental groups have their baggage in all kinds of ways. Um, and I think they're getting more sophisticated. And again, I, I've worked with a lot of environmental groups. Uh, is there a difference between kind of Canada and the U.S. for environmental groups? I, I don't know. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities, probably more than differences. I, I, I've met with Bill McKibben, and you look at what they're doing down here with 350.org and the global movement. You know, it's quite amazing. And, and some of the people are saying, like, Bill McKibben, the carbon bubble, talking about the environment as an economic issue has probably been the most influential thing that has persuaded groups to change their attitudes towards this. And, and so I think the environmental groups are actually getting wise to some of the things that we're talking about here, and they're, they're leading some of the things that I've even been saying. You know, the, the, the carbon bubble argument that stranded assets, and if you're familiar with these kinds of arguments, that, that simply these assets are not going to be valuable in the future because society is going to not allow us to extract oil, gas, and coal at the scale that we're doing right now, and that people who are investing in oil, gas, and coal are actually putting their money into dead portfolios because that's not the future. And so that's been very persuasive. Um, I don't know if I would say there's huge differences, but you know the environmental groups are, are working really hard, putting lots of pressure, and I think that's super important. I think we need to be 
put in awkward positions to think carefully about the future. I also think the environmental groups, though, need to think carefully about you know, whether or not they're blocking um, the transition from happening by being too ardent and dogmatic. I mean, I, I cannot really speak about the difference, but what I, I see more, I will say, and I mean, you work more with environmental group, but I feel like in the last 15 years, as uh, environmental groups on both sides of the border are preaching less to the choir and getting and crossing the eyes and engaging more with uh, other people, and something that we see more and more, or preaching in the desert as, uh, as well. Uh, so it, it's great to, to see the, the shift of like and finding ways to in, engage from other point of view and other perspective. So that I would say like, and that's why I think we see a lot of, of change and things are moving forward, even in conservative uh, environments. I think it's part of the reason why we see some progress uh, at home. Now in Quebec, I would say like in all the parties, it's a, it's a consensus. Nobody is requesting the cap, the cap and trade market, the carbon market we have. Uh, and because we went through those cycles of election and doubts when this, those questions was, we, we gave the time uh, to, to the population also to get on board with, with that. So um, pushing too hard sometimes <laughs> break, break the, the consensus and I think environmental groups now are more following the path and understand from the population or like the more conservative economic groups what it takes to get them on board. I think, I mean, I would say I have more experience with environmental groups in the US over the last five years. And I think my observation would be as you move into the middle of the US, um, and I think this is mirrored in Canada as well, um, you tend to have groups that are cognizant of the fact that, that you need to have sort of a multifaceted solution. Um, the closer you are to your local economy, uh, the more likely you are to sort of understand that as, again, I hate to keep going back, but as the administrator said, you want more people standing on the stage ra rather than less. And I think my experience is, and sort of Alberta environmental groups have to exist in a, in a situation where the vast majority of voters are related to or know somebody who works in the oil and gas sector. And so to s simply present a simplistic, well, you've got to leave that in the ground now, argument essentially excludes you from the policy process uh, if you want to make incremental uh, change. And I would say, as I've worked, like, um, you know, I've talked to environmental groups in Minneapolis and here in Chicago, I would say that they, they speak in sort of those same terms, like we can't just as a blanket statement be saying we need to exclude this or you know there's no way we can do that it's it's about bringing people to the table and trying to find uh solutions and i would say as you get closer to washington um no problem. uh that might be more interesting what i'm saying uh, <laughs> Uh, as you get closer to Washington, I would say the, the things just become more binary, and that's true across a lot of different policies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it tends to be, you know, we need to raise a few hundred million dollars and just run hard against who's ever on the other side of an issue. And I think in Canada, we've benefited from maybe lagging a little bit in that approach to policy making, where we do sit down and talk to each other. And I'm really hoping that continues for, from a Canadian perspective, because I think that's how we got to some of the solutions that we've talked about today. Okay, actually the American has something to say. Um, being an American and working for Canada over the years, um, I've seen the enormous differences between our two countries. And, and I say I always spend a lot of time translating U.S. to Canadian and Canadian to U.S., what our Canadians may not have remembered. Um, David Suzuki is um, widely loved, widely renowned environmentalist in Canada. And I don't know if anyone in the room, have you heard of David Suzuki? A handful. OK, um, I'm going to get on the internet. Um, I, I strongly encourage you to, uh, to look him up online to, to see some of the video he's done. He, it, it's a, a voice that Canadians recognize. He is part of the conversation that has been for decades. 
Ian and I have had a few conversations about his personal experiences with David Suzuki. So there is sort of this 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 one person who is tremendously impactful in Canada, and, and I can't think of anyone in the States who I would put in that same category. So I think there is this commonality that runs through, and he's a voice that's listened to. That's great, amazing. David Suzuki is the, the CBC or equivalent of PBS, did an, a, a, a contest to see who the most famous Canadian was. And um, David Suzuki was fourth, but he was the only one that was alive. And, and so he's, on all accounts, considered the most famous living Canadian, and he is our greatest environmentalist, um, which is interesting because he's everywhere. He's in, and I've, I've worked really closely with David, and he, he, he appeals to people who are, you know, 80 all the way to 8. Um, and so that, he's done a huge amount to kind of contribute to our, our kind of ecological uh, baseline, I would say. Um, and um, yeah, definitely check him out. If you go to my YouTube channel, I'll, I'll just I have a caveat whole that. With him. I'll caveat that and yeah. say that I think I think that in recent years, David Suzuki has become a more polarizing figure uh, in Canada. Absolutely. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Good Canadian. Uh, <laughs> he's speaking way more truth to power these days. He and he, there's some interesting things going on. Like he's getting into rooms and he's saying, along with other people, that direct action is a form of mitigation. If you stop the pipelines, it's actually the equivalent of mitigation. There's people that are saying serious things around what we need to do in the country, and Suzuki's definitely one of them. And that can catch people, you know, in a good way or a bad way, depending on who you are and what your perspective is. Depends on whether you think he's an expert in oil markets or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a uh, person who spends a lot of time in Canada, I would say he, with becoming more polarizing these days, um, I would say he's the equivalent of the Canadian David Attenborough was going to be so yeah. bold. So, I mean, he is yeah. that kind of swift in the circles. So, uh, my name is still Hummel. I'm a junior here majoring in environmental studies. Um, recently, I was reading uh, an article in The Guardian by uh, Bill McKibben where he quoted uh, Justin Trudeau saying that no country would find 170, 30, uh, 173 billion barrels of oil and just leave it there. And my question to you guys is, what do my community and I do to project to Justin Trudeau and the other neoliberals of the world that just leaving it there is actually exactly what we want them to do? I, so that's my... Um, I think that, again, it goes back to your view around the energy system. And I think that it's fair to say that even, you know, even the most progressive estimates show that oil is going to play a role, you know, in transportation. But also, you know, your Nissan Leaf, the dashboard's made out of oil too. Um, so oil is going to play a role in our economy for a long time to come. And so then the question becomes twofold, I would say. One, how are you? deciding where that oil comes from from a geographic perspective, and then two, how are you reducing the emissions associated from the oil that, are, that is being used in your economy? And I would say the Prime Minister's point is, again, that a knee-jerk opposition to oil production in places where I would say the politics are more favorable to the leave it in the ground movement does not equate to progress on climate. So if you are blocking pipelines from places that are reducing emissions from oil and then going and buying your oil from somewhere else without those regulations, you're actually doing the climate a disservice. You might feel like you're making progress on climate, because you've stopped an energy company from building a project, but that's not the case. So, in that context, you really need to look at the whole oil market, and you need to look at who is making the policy decisions that will drive down emissions going forward, and then you need to look at how am I positioning myself on infrastructure, how am I positioning myself on where I want my oil to come from, Again, I think Canada as a whole is essentially in, it's us and Norway. 
in terms of ambition in climate policy uh, from a major oil and gas producer. I love my friends in Texas. They are not implementing the Obama methane regulations right now. They are not putting a price on carbon and they are the fastest growing oil producer in the world today. And that is a product of policy choices. That is a product of an environmental movement making choices about what they're going to oppose and what they're gonna let pass by. And I respect the fact that the environmental movement needs to pick fights that they think they can win or have a better degree of success fighting. But I think the problem with that when you're driven as a movement by the ease of your target as opposed to the long-term impact of your outcome, you're not necessarily doing the best from a climate perspective. So I hope that answers your question, but I think that as a, um, from a Canadian perspective is how we see things. Another little something. I think there's places, I mean, if it makes sense at different places, like in Alberta to explore, oh yeah, I think it's, it's something specific. It's, Canada is diverse, that's the thing. It's not a monolith block. Like, there's places in Canada where we decide to let the oil in the ground. Uh, that's what Quebec decided uh, two years ago when we decided to stop the project of exploration on the Anticosti Island and decided to submit that with uh, the Canadian government for uh, the UNESCO Biodiversity Reserve uh, and Parks. So um, there's, uh, there's ways also where we are doing it in places. It's easier for Canada because we made the choice 60 years ago to go with hydroelectricity. And, and, but it also brings other challenges, like to go to the target of reducing 37.5% by 2030 or gas emission. Now that we made this decision to go with hydropower, it's much more challenging right now to achieve those goals because we already did kind of 88, 98% of uh, energy is hydroelectricity right now. So to achieve those goals, it's really challenging at the same time. So there's other things also then I will say like oil and, uh, and, and other, ch there's other challenges like that has to be addresses as well across the border. It's an easy one to target maybe uh, the, the, ga the, the oil sense, but there's, a, there's, a, there's other challenges that has to be not un underlooked, I think. So I'll just add one. One point, since we're at Loyola, um, uh, in 2015, there was a major European oil company that um, sold their oil sand stake um, and talked about how that would help them reduce their uh, overall carbon intensity of their portfolio. And then a few months later, they made a major investment in Iranian and Iranian gas field. And I think again, you know, we talked a little bit last night or the administrator did about sort of your ethical framework mm -hmm. around how you're thinking about energy policy. And I would say when your ethical frame gets narrowed to the point that you decide that that's positive for investment dollars to go to countries that, you know, across other metrics maybe don't share your values. I you know when it comes to Iran, I think we'll probably have fairly strong consensus in this room that they don't. Um, I, think you, I think you need to draw back the lens a little bit to, to let some of those other values have a role in how you're thinking about the climate debate and the energy debate, especially when it comes to oil and mm. gas. Um, and I think that's a really, it's something that's not easy to put on a bumper sticker, but I think from an ethical perspective, it is something that as I think, especially young people who are, you know, hearing from Bill McKibben and other voices, um, it's important to sort of draw back that lens and make sure that you're, you're encouraging these kind of development activities in places that share your broader value set. If I can put that way. I teach uh, meteorology and climate change. Um, you mentioned that you expect Manitoba by the year 2100 to have, did I hear this right, 70 days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I 
challenge that because I don't know if you've noticed, but there's actually been a downward trend in the number of hot days, but there's been an upward trend in the number of warm nights and the number of upward trend in the lower number of cold nights and cold days. So this is my challenge to you, is to make sure that when you complete your next movie, because I think this first movie is done, is that what you're saying? I made a bunch of movies that are done. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about the one that just came out. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I see often is the narrative about climate change, about how to get people to agree that it's something we should do, is we pick something like a hot day, and we go, this is going to be what's going to happen in 100 years from now. The trend actually is not there for warmer summers in the Midwest. We've actually had cooler summers, but we've had warmer overnight lows and warmer winter days. So what happens is people go, oh my god, I love the fact that it's 60 degrees and sunny in January. But those are the days that we should be more concerned about. It's not so much the number of hot days. As much as I want to agree with you, long hot summers are not good, but that has not been the trend. So I don't know where the data that you talked about came from, but it's not consistent with science. <laughs> and it's okay. That's good. Okay, keep going. Yeah, I'll answer your question in a second. Okay, okay. But it's true. I mean, the data is there. It's not consistent. Do you know what data set we're using? What data set you're using? Yeah. I assume Environment Canada. We are using Environment Canada data. Okay. 70, 100 degree days by 2100 is kind of out of whack with the trend. Okay? And even here in the Midwest, some of the forecasts for hot... Can I ask you a question? Do you believe in climate change? No. Okay, then... A question. Okay, then, then no, you... No, no, that, uh, your, your, que your question, the context for your question is clear. So I'm going to answer... But I don't... Uh, but, uh, climate change is not something you believe in. Religion is. Climate change is something you accept as a science. So I've had that question. Do you, do you accept that climate change is man-made? Well, of course. Okay. I teach climate change, I'm with you on that, but I want to make sure that you get the science right. And the narrative is right. There's a reason why we've been backed up against the corner here, is because the, the, the way that we've been explaining climate change has not been exactly the way it should be talked about. It's okay to talk about the fact that we have summers and winters that are out of whack, but the warmer winters are really the things that I think we should be really focusing on. Yeah, no, so I, I don't disagree with you. So I, I gave a 15-minute presentation where I showed a couple of variables. The Climate Atlas has dozens of variables. The data set is based on PKIC data from the University of Victoria, which is statistically downscaled global climate model data, which is the Environment Canada baseline data. Uh, the Climate Atlas has been peer-reviewed by the federal government, by all of the top climatologists in Canada. And we know that that data is correct. So I, 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 I refuse to stand up and have you call this uh, incorrect because we know it's true in terms of the best global climate model data projections. I don't disagree with you. The winters are, are warming and that's a big issue. And there's many issues that we need to talk about. I showed, the very first slide I showed was January months or the month of January into the future. So I did show data that, that, that spoke to your concern. Um, and yeah, of course, there's a multiplicity of ways that you tell the story. And I can tell you for sure, though, that the, the, the center of Canada is warming up, is going to warm up like that. That is how the data is, is unfolding. We've shown this to many people, and nobody is disputing that that is a likely outcome. Um, but it, it, I, I also agree there's, there's an importance in the way that we communicate this stuff. Showing mean values is really complicated because an average is not what is going to happen. There are the extremes. And so we, we're careful to show kind of the bell-shaped curve around kind of the low, mean, and, and, and high version of all of those variables. Um, and we've been doing that in a, in a collaborative way with the climatologists in the federal government and other collaborators at universities to make sure that, that we're not oversimplifying the message. And so if I oversimplified the message, I apologize. Um, but I'm happy to stand up here and defend this all day, but we don't have enough time to do that, so maybe we should move to the next question. And, and one last thing, I'm not discrediting the data. It just seems that 100 degree days seems more like it'll probably be like 90 degree days based on what the trends have been. But again, to more fully explain climate change, round it out with the warmer winters and the warmer overnight lows. Yeah, we're doing it all. 
I, but I think that's, that really is probably a more better narrative yep. moving forward. Thanks. I'm a student here. I have a question, and you kind of spoke to it earlier about ethical consumption. And I know you mentioned, also you mentioned with the upcoming elections and kind of shaping the narrative that allows individuals to kind of force accountability for ethical consumption, like you mentioned too. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate on any ideas you have on how to sort of force that shift in a community psyche in this psyche. Like, just the way that we as consumers think about that, and how do you kind of change what has been the overwhelming consensus for so long? And you mentioned this too, that maybe capitalism is not really sustainable, you know, and it's sort of incompatible with a more conservationist ethic. So just, I guess, if you could elaborate on any ideas you have on how you can sort of force that social shift in creating a more ethical consumption narrative. There's some interesting conversations happening around the circular economy in Canada and like zero growth economies. There are real conversations happening around that stuff. And again, I think we're in our infancy, although, you know, some scholars have been talking about this forever. Uh, you know, E.F. E. F. Schumacher and, you know, small is beautiful. And we've been talking about it, but people are seriously starting to look at, go, you know, this isn't just a philosophy anymore. These are actually, you know, principles for how we should actually be structuring you know, the way in which we live on this planet. And so, uh, you know, those are big things, though. You know, we're not going to flip to that overnight. But I, I, it, I'm encouraged by the, the way in which those conversations are actually starting to take place in a more substantive way. And I think the real challenge is this thing called the transition. You know, the transition is messy. How do we deal with all of these complexities of old systems, new systems, you know, old energy, new energy? And, and one thing I want to say is that, you know, renewables are not some sort of, you know, panacea. All energy has an impact. I come from Manitoba where we have huge hydroelectric, you know, infrastructure and there are battles over the impact of that hydroelectricity and what it does to ecosystems and communities. And so just because it's hydroelectricity doesn't mean it's necessarily, you know, a lower impact. It's a different impact. And so, again, we have to wrap our heads around all kinds of things. You know, solar panels and, and wind power and hydro are not just going to get us out of this. There's all kinds of relationships and I think it gets to the core of your question that need to change. Um, to be able to actually integrate systems that are thoughtful and that are respectful, not just to the environment, to pe but to people. And so, you know, th these, are, these are huge things that no panel and no conference is going to sort out. But the conversation is starting to figure out how do we move forward in a different kind of way. And, and, and again, I think being at Loyola is interesting because the ethics framework is critical. Like the ethics of this is and, and how we don't leave people behind and, and we don't leave coal miners behind and we don't leave oil and gas people behind in the, in the oil sands. You know, these are really important questions because if we alienate people and say this is our future and you're not part of it, then we are not going to get anywhere better. And so it's in creating an inclusive conversation that, that leads people to something like, say, the circular economy. So they go, wow, that could actually be good for us. And they get it and they understand it. And so conversation is key. So I, I'm just a simple government guy. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think, I mean, and I mean, I won't speak for Quebec, but I think that's where carbon pricing is so critical because, you know, there are people, uh, obviously, that are having sort of the, the sort of philosophical conversations or making lifestyle choices uh, that sort of are deeply researched. But the majority of people are going to Costco. Um, and the great thing about carbon pricing is that you build in an economic incentive for the person that it's, that's at Costco to buy things based on an adjust, a, a price that's essentially adjusted for the carbon footprint of that product. And I think, you know, as a guy with, you know, two kids, I, re I like the fact that that externality is built in and I don't need to necessarily sort of figure out where my almonds came from. Um, you know, when I buy almonds, I want like, I like the fact that there's sort of, the system is able to adjust based on that economic signal. That's not to sort of um, underplay sort of those broader ethical considerations, but I think as, from a government perspective, 
pricing is really a shortcut into sort of starting to address some of those issues or build them into the system um, early on uh, in, this, in this transition process. We are out of time, but I'd like to thank our three panelists for coming today.